We have a surprise guest this afternoon. Um, would have even surprised me 24 hours ago if we knew we had a guest this afternoon, so that's how surprised he is. Um, John Bolton has worked as a policeman, as a prosecution and defence lawyer. He's a one-man band defender of Australian freedoms, values and laws. He has spoken... <laughs> He has spoken at and helped to organise many Reclaim rallies and John has delayed his travel home to South Australia so he can attend our meeting and he has volunteered to show us his world view. So ladies and gentlemen, John Bolton. Thanks very much Ron and Ron who I met with over the last couple of days and this is my first meeting here and I've brought two new members along so I hope Ron that does yeah. <laughs> now, uh, obviously, normally when you do these things, you prepare a speech and so forth. But I only found out at Martin's night place. About Ten o'clock over a glass of red that I was being here. So this morning I've revamped things, and obviously, speaking to the converted, I don't need to tell you guys what Islam is and so forth. Uh, as I introduced, I'm a barrister and a solicitor. Uh, I used to have a small country practice, employed ten people, four lawyers and five support staff. Uh, my wife died uh, late, last, uh, well, late last year, uh, but she was also highly supportive of the, uh, everything I was doing against Islam and from time to time she would actually volunteer to go into care so that I could go away and speak at Canberra and meetings like that because very strong feminists and as we all know, uh, feminism and Islam are just anathema to each other. Uh, I've been labelled by friends of mine as a political activist and that's a mantle that I quite like to wear. Uh, you know, I think that's what we are doing is political activism. Unfortunately, that, that's actually who we are. So I do uh, lots of lobbying, not just about Islam, but about domestic violence. I uh, make submissions to royal commissions regarding uh, the family and children's welfare, in, in, both in South Australia and in Australia. And we're talking about publicity. Uh, for instance, so far this year, I'm quite pleased, on the 1st of January and only two days ago, I've had letters in the uh, South Australian press. Now, when I started a year ago, they wouldn't print anything that had anything to do with being anti-Islam. So I think we as a movement, Australia-wide, we have already changed the dialogue. We've changed what we're, what's going on. Now, yes, mate. Tom, could you help Ron write a couple of letters to the Danes? <laughs> <laughs> People's... I, I also, I think I had three letters in the Australian national uh, paper over the last uh, six or nine months as well. But you, I, for every ten that you write, you might get one in if you're lucky. And it's just a question of writing it in the way that they find acceptable. My starting position is a lot different to other people. And certainly, you know, you see the tattoo brigade uh, with the Australian flags all over them and things like that. And if you're not careful, by mixing with them, you get tarred with that same sort of brush. I do a lot of media. And people often ask me, especially the media, because I usually wear a three-piece suit, in cooler weather at least, and the media almost always finds it necessary to comment and they say, Who are you? how come you're on the side of being anti-Islam? That's not the sort of person that we expect to be presenting that face. So I turn around and say, well, you don't start off with anti-Islam. You don't just say, I'm anti-Islam without a reason. You start from the other end. Now, I'm pro the Australian Constitution pro-Australian civil and criminal law, but as a matter of fact, those who choose to disobey those laws in our constitution form a self-identifying group, and they are all Islam. So I want to lead you through to why I'm anti-Islam. I say being anti-Islam is a good thing. Uh, every time I've asked that by the press, uh, I'm not embarrassed to say I'm anti-Islam. We shouldn't be embarrassed about standing up for Australian culture. As a matter of fact, Australian culture is better than Islamic culture. That's just clear. And, and so we shouldn't be embarrassed about, having, uh, about saying those things. And I always start the rallies with those sorts of things. I've spoken two or three times in Adelaide, a couple of anti-MOS rallies, been in Mel uh, Canberra a couple of times. And I was at the Melton rally last time. I was asked by Reclaim Australia to go over there and see if I could make sure that was a fairly calm uh, rally, which it actually was. Contrary to what was reported in the media, we were all calm. Uh, it, the only, uh, 
It's, the only violence started when the uh, lefties were sort of screaming out at the police uh, and demanding that they be let through to, to us to disrupt it. And they're the ones that attack the police horses, not the, pe <coughs> not the people on our side. And uh, as you know from the Cronulla uh, um, celebration, shall we call it, just recently, uh, there were no arrests around the, uh, the pig on a spit. Uh, the arrests occurred by the lefties trying to break through the police lines to get to the protesters. Often in the, uh, when the media interview uh, me, they say, how come anti-Islam so disjointed? And what I then do is point out that it, you go up to your average Liberal supporter or your average Labor supporter, and I've stood polling booths, and you'd be hard-pressed to find anybody who could articulate a Liberal or Labor policy. And so I respond then and say, we get thousands of people in Australia. The first Adelaide rally had 1,500. Now, that's not an exaggeration. Our publicists often say 1,800 or 2,000. Generally, 1,500 people on the steps of Parliament House turning out for a general support of being anti-Islam. Now, when was the last time you saw a Liberal or Labor uh, rally just in general support of what they were doing? So we are changing it, and you've got a lot of members now, and I've been watching you uh, and what you've been doing on, on your Facebook, and that, that's one of the reasons I made contact when I came up here. My aim is to prevent the Islamization of Australia. That's the objective. Everything... Yeah. Everything else then is a sort of a sub-objective about that. So when you're talking about getting people into local government, state government or federal government, those are just ways of going about stopping the Islamification of our country. The Islamists are very skilled in this. They used tolerant countries and they decide that they're going to colonise them. They have a clear plan of increasing uh, uh, their percentages as they go and they're very well funded. We're naive at this. We're finding out how to do it as we go along. And that's why I, I go everywhere I can. I was in Perth when he at Wilders came over for the launch of the ALA, which was a terrific uh, uh, meeting to, to be with him just out, outside of town. There was a UKIP lady there, and you might be watching her now. She's a woman on the stage with Tommy Robinson. And she was saying, can you help us in the UK? So later on over a beer is the way I like to do things. Um, I said, how can we help? And her answer was, I don't know. You see, we're struggling with how to, do, how to deal with, with the Islamification of our country. Now, the reason I say that uh, Australian culture is better than Islamic culture, there are golden bullet knockdown arguments. You know, freedom is better than suppression. Democracy is better than being told what to do. Equal, equality of sexes is better than inequality. These are golden bullet knockdown arguments which stand out and are unassailable. And when I'm called a bigot or a xenophobe or an Islamophobe, and as almost always when you go on a radio show, that's what they throw at you, <coughs> designed to shut you up and make it look as though what you're going to say is a, a, a silly thing. My response is, just tell me one thing in all the thousands of words that I've written in any video that I've put out in any demonstration that I've been at, tell me one thing that is racist or sexist or bigoted or Islamophobic. They change the subject. Yeah. Because you know, for all the reasons that we should. Yeah. I say, I believe in equality of the sexes. Our women are equal to our men in Australia. Tell me why I'm wrong about that. I believe that our children, when they go to school, shouldn't be told that if they blow someone up or kill someone, they'll go to heaven. That's actually inciting violence. It's against our constitution. It's a great, against our civil and criminal law. If I went to a gang of Boy Scouts and said, go out and blow people up, set fire to their houses because you'll go to heaven, my feet wouldn't touch the ground. <laughs> One of the things that I'm often criticised for, and I did a long radio interview in Perth about this, this young interviewer kept saying to me, why are you lumping everybody together? You say you're anti-Islam, aren't you lumping everybody together? Now, for some reason they don't want to engage in the argument about the difference between saying, start off with Australian civil and criminal law. Who is it that is not complying and who, it, who is it that is? Now, I think that the evidence that uh, Tarek Fattah gave to the Canadian uh, uh, Senate inquiry into multiculturalism and immigration, he's a Muslim, 
And he says that 80 Canadians, and I think that transfers to Australia, 80% 80, 80 of Muslims in Canada don't even go to a mosque. They just want to, want to go about their life, raising their children and so forth. And they don't want to be told every Friday that they're apostates, that, they're, that they should be coming along, they should be involved in the Islamification of their country. So to those people, I say, they don't need my permission to go along to, uh, to practice their faith if that's what they're doing. Uh, but those who breach Australian civil and criminal law, I say zero tolerance. And at the moment we're giving too much carrot and not enough steam. The basic version of Islam, I'm sure you know, and I'm, so I'm not going to go into it, but they're not integratable. They come here as isolationists. They set up enclaves. You do not need a 500-seat mosque in Bendigo for the 16 or 20 people that actually go to prayer there. <laughs> Uh, so they're setting up, and, and they're doing it in Adelaide, and they're doing it everywhere they go. They set up a sort of a super mosque, a community centre, a school, a community around it, within which the women uh, will be expected to be subservient, uh, and all the other things that go with, uh, with Islam. They preach isolation from the host culture. They're told not to mix with us. The reason why the Grand Mufti of Islam in Australia doesn't speak English after 18 years Every time he doesn't speak English, he is sending the message to his followers that Arabic is the holy language, English is the language of the devil, he refuses to speak it, and he's setting the example. When he comes out, there's, he's against ISIS. Well, Al-Qaeda's against ISIS. You know, uh, it's not a great statement. Because he says he's against ISIS, it doesn't say he's in favour of Australian culture and, and democracy.